We continue to worship and glorify our Heavenly Father this morning through the proclamation of His Word. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to 2 Peter chapter 2. There should be a Bible in the seat back pocket in front of you or perhaps behind you if you do not have one with you. As you are turning to 2 Peter chapter 2, I'd like to welcome any guests and visitors who are with us. We are thankful that you are here worshiping with us this morning. We'd also like to let you know that it's our general practice here at Church of the Resurrection to look at whole books of the Bible one at a time and to walk through them verse by verse, thought by thought, section by section. That's what brings us to 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning. It is our prayer that as we look at the whole counsel of God's word, that our God and our Heavenly Father would be pleased to speak to us through it. So we come eagerly anticipating our Lord. We come eagerly wanting to hear from our God. And our prayer is that our Lord would do just that, that he would speak to us, not only us corporately as a church, but also to each of us individually through his word this morning. For those who are regular attenders, I would like to remind you and encourage you, please, throughout the week, be reading through 2 Peter to try to read through it all in one go. This is a great way for family worship to be done, to sit around right before you have dinner and read through um, 2 Peter together. It would be a great blessing to do that. So as we are looking at individual parts and pieces of this letter on the Lord's Day, you will have the whole letter in mind and you will be able to see the forest, as it were, for the trees that are there. This shouldn't take you any more than five or ten minutes to do. And for those who have um, told me they've been doing this with their family, they do find it a great blessing, not only in their worship time at home, but also it enhances their worship time here on the Lord's Day. Well, before we read God's word and hear what he has for us in 2 Peter chapter 2, let's go to him and call upon him and ask his help for the reading and proclamation of his word. Please pray with me. Our glorious God, we once again come to you as we turn to your word. We come with eager expectation. We come with hope that you will meet us, that you will come here And be with us, Lord, by the power of your spirit, that as you have called us into your presence, we are with you. And now, through your word, that you would open it to us, that you would illuminate it to our minds, to our hearts, so that we would be able to see new and wonderful things, that we would be able to hear your voice speaking to us through this word. Lord, we ask that you would use it to transform us, that you would use it to sanctify us, For we know that your word is truth and you sanctify your people by it. That we are set apart, that we are changed, that we are transformed by your word. And Lord, we we come each Lord's Day and sometimes it can get a bit redundant, a bit mundane. But we ask that that would not be the case this morning. We ask this morning as we open your word that we would see it afresh. That we would be reminded of the joy that we have in our God and in our Savior Jesus. And that you would use this to inflame our hearts once again. That you would use this to remind us of who we are in Christ. That you would use it to remind us of who you call us to be as your people. And that this would all be done for your glory in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're beginning at the middle of verse 10 and reading down to verse 16 this morning. Please listen carefully as I read the word of our living God for us this morning. Bold and willfully, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wages for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable 
for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accused children forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. The grass withers and the flowers may fall, but the word of our living God, it will stand forever and ever. Praise be to our God for his word. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as you might recall, and from the context of our passage this morning, Peter has been speaking of genuine prophets who predicted the forthcoming of the day of the Lord, the the return of Jesus, the second coming. Then he turned his attention to the problem that was facing the church, false teachers who undermine this glorious hope we have as Christians that the Lord will come again for us. As Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a room for you, to to place a place for you in the household of God. And if it were not so, I would not tell you this. And these false teachers were coming in and saying, ah, that's not true. Peter points out that these false teachers will not ultimately triumph because God will judge them when he returns. And they will not triumph also because God will protect and preserve his saints, us, through this until the end. Our God will not let his church succumb to their false teachings. In order to confront these false teachers, Peter teaches us of the importance of godly living by by reminding us that that Christ will once come again. Further, Peter reminds us that he himself was an eyewitness to the ministry and to the glory of God that was on display in Jesus, that pointed to the fact that Jesus would come again. The second coming, he told us, as you'll recall, was not a myth. Because it was not only anticipated at the transfiguration where where Peter says, I saw the face of Jesus as it shone with the glory that he will have when he comes again. But it also was predicted by unbreakable prophecies in the word of God. Not only is it attested to by Peter's eyewitness, but the word of God tells us Jesus is coming again. As you might recall, Peter gave two reasons in verses 4 through, five, 4 through 9 of chapter 2 as to why these false teachers will face judgment. He told us of their sexual sin and their rebelliousness. In our passage that we have before us this morning, Peter unpacks these two themes in reverse order. First, he deals with the arrogance of the teacher's And then their sensuality. Peter continues to confront these false teachers by reminding them of the destruction that they will face for their sins. And the destruction they will face because of their harassment and deception of God's church. Of his bride. I don't know about you. And if you're married you may be able to relate to this. But there's no way to get me more mad, more fast than to mess with my bride. Well, that's what God is saying here this morning. Do not mess with my bride, for if you do, your destruction will be coming swift to you. Well, in light of this introduction, there are two things that I would like us to see in our passage this morning, two things that God's word has for us here this morning. First, we will examine the false teacher's destruction And second, we will explore the false teacher's deception, their destruction and their deception. Let's look at each of these points in turn. First, the false teacher's destruction. We see that in verses 10 through the first part of verse 13 of our passage this morning. 
Our passage begins with Peter describing the rebelliousness of these false teachers with two terms. He says it's bold and it's willfully done. One commentator suggests that a dynamic way of understanding these two terms put together could be something like boldly arrogant. That's how he describes them. They are boldly arrogant in what they are doing. The issue here is that the false teachers have an extraordinary confidence, but this confidence was in the wrong teaching. They were confident in what they were saying. They said it with boldness. They said it with surety. But they were wrong. Peter is once again reminding us here that the content of our belief, what we believe, is just as important as our sincerity. You could be, after all, sincerely wrong. I don't know about you, but in the age of technology with our cell phones, we have information at our fingertips. At any time we want, we can Google facts about this or that. And I have been on the end of somebody who has been certain that this fact was so. I I know this is so, and I'm willing to to bank it all. Let's go. That's right. Someone pulls out their phone and goes, let's just check that out. And they do a little quick Googling, and they go, yeah, nope. I've been sincerely wrong before. This idea that we can be sincerely wrong in matters of religion, in the matters of what we believe about God, this goes against much of our postmodern culture. Our culture that insists that a sincerely held belief, that's all that matters, is if you are sincere in what you believe. A, a sincerely held belief cannot be wrong in the areas of of religion and God, for after all, how can you prove those sorts of claims anyway? But we know from God's word that no matter how sincere a belief is, if it doesn't line up with God's word, if it doesn't match with what the scripture says, it's false. For example, there are many in our culture who are sincerely convinced that God doesn't exist. Or at the very least, they'll say, well, well, we don't know if he exists, but if he does exist, we're certain he does not care about our immoral behavior down here on earth. We know from God's word, we know from God himself, that not only does he exist, but he will judge those who live such openly rebellious lives. After all, that's Peter's main point in our passage this morning. These false teachers were not overtly denying the existence of God, but they were denying that Christ would come again and that he would judge their immoral lifestyles. Their lifestyles, in other words, were portraying something different than what they claimed to believe. Brothers and sisters, this should be a warning for us here this morning. We ought to be a people who diligently search the scriptures. Church of the Resurrection should be known for a place where the scriptures are studied thoroughly to ensure that our convictions line up with what God's word says. Now, don't misunderstand what I am saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have sincerely held beliefs. I'm not saying we should be convinced and convicted about what we believe. Hopefully every Lord's Day you see that I get up here and I pour everything I have into these sermons because I believe it. I believe what the Word of God says. But it's not enough to simply be sincere in our beliefs. But we must also believe what Scripture actually says. And the only way to know what Scripture actually says is to open it and to truly, diligently study it. Do not take my word for it. Don't say, well, my pastor once said, remember what Acts 17 says about the Bereans and about how they didn't take the apostles Paul's word for it. Remember, Paul came to them. 
He came and he brought the word of God to them and they said, okay, thank you, Paul. We've heard what you have to say. Now we're going to go back and look at what the scripture says and listen to what Acts 17 says about them. It says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were more noble because they listened intently to what Paul had to say. And they said, we like what we hear, Paul, but that's not enough. We know that you make some good arguments, Paul, but that's not enough. We know you've got a great smile, Paul, but that's not enough what they say about me at least (laughs) they took what Paul was saying and they went back to the scriptures and did you catch it how often do they do this daily every day they went back to the scriptures to see is what Paul is telling me lining up with what scripture says the audacity and the arrogance of these false teachers is seen And how they blaspheme or slander, Peter says, the glorious ones. And do not even tremble in doing so. The reference here to glorious ones, as I often, as I'm preparing sermons, I think, oh, I'm encouraging you to be reading through this. I'm wondering if there are parts that are kind of tripping you up as you're doing that. And I wondered if if this was one of those parts. What is he talking about here when he talks about the glorious ones? Well, this could be a reference. Some commentators take it as reference to church leaders or even possible to um, civil authorities. But I think what Peter goes on to say in verse 11, based on that, it seems likely that he's actually talking about angelic beings, about angels, that they are in view here. Now, Peter does not tell us exactly how they were blaspheming or slandering angels. But it is something that they were doing, he tells us, with boldness, without a care for any repercussions at all. We don't care. We're going to blaspheme. We're going to slander these angels. Then Peter contrasts in verse 11 how the angelic beings who are before the throne of God How these ones, being greater in power and glory than these false teachers, how they show restraint and do not repay these false teachers in kind. As one commentator puts it, the angels, though stronger and more powerful than these false teachers, do not use insults when pronouncing judgment on them from the Lord. So these false teachers, they're blaspheming the angels, but the angels, when they come and they they pronounce judgment upon them, they do not do so in slanderous or, or blasphemous terms. Peter's point is that these false teachers were free with their language against the angels, while the angels showed self control in how they pronounced their judgments before God. Then in verse 12, In the first part of verse 13, Peter compares these false teachers and their behavior to the beasts of the field. How would you like to be described in those terms, to be compared to a beast in a field? He calls them irrational creatures who only act upon instinct. It is to say they are are not using their rational faculties. They are not using their God-given minds in arriving at their conclusions, but instead they are being led by their emotions, by their desires for pleasure, for for what they want more of. And we'll see what that is in a moment. As we see this, it seems like a very apropos description of our current culture. We are told today, as long as it feels good, as long as it makes you happy, It must be right. People in our culture today do not stop, not even for a moment, to think about the implications or the consequences of their actions. And when you try to say, wait a minute, have you thought through the implications of that? Their response is, shut up. I don't want to hear from you. If you're not going to support me in my lifestyle, 
You've got nothing to say to me. They simply seek to find pleasure. And just like animals, as Peter goes on, these false teachers were born to be caught and destroyed because they blaspheme or slander the angels. In issues, he says, that they know nothing about. So not only are they bold in their assertions, they don't even know what they're talking about. They are ignorant of any of the the matters, any of the facts, any of the details pertaining to what they're talking about. And as they are causing disturbance within the church, they will ultimately be destroyed and suffer for their wrongdoing. Peter wants both the church and the world to know that the immoral behavior of these false teachers will not go unnoticed by God. Now when Peter refers here to destruction, he says, will also be destroyed in their destruction. He is referring to a place that we call hell. The place where God's judgment is ultimately poured out upon those who are not in Christ. As Paul notes in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When I'm looking at passages to preach and I see things like this in the text, I I don't get up here and say, oh, this is going to be a great day. I get to talk about hell. But you should think it's a great day for me to talk about hell. Because we need to know the truth. We need to know what reality is. As Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 25, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the angel, for the devil and his angels. There is a real place called hell. Real people are going to go there. And they are going to be a part of from any glimpse of the Lord, any notion of his glory. Here on earth, while we are living, those who live apart from Christ, they get a glimpse of God. They get a glimpse of his glory. Romans chapter 1 says, they look around the world and they see that God exists. They see his beauty on display in creation. You could take an unbeliever to the Grand Canyon, and as that sun sets, and we see that beautiful sky above Even an unbeliever will look at that and say, wow, that's beautiful. They're getting a glimpse of our God. But hell, they will have no glimpses of this. That's why it's referred to as outer darkness. There are no glimpses of anything beautiful there. There's nothing there to to draw them to and say, well, this is a good place. I'm glad I am here. These false teachers, we've seen their destruction in hell for their arrogance and ignorance and immoral lifestyle. Secondly, this morning we look at the false teachers' deception, and we see that at the end of verse 13 to verse 16. Peter says, They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. That is, these false teachers are so consumed by their immoral lifestyles that they do not even wait until evening, until the veil of darkness has come to practice their licentiousness. The prophet Isaiah gives us a warning of these kinds of people in chapter 5 of his prophecy when he says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may run after strong drink. Woe to those who who wake up in the morning and as soon as they wake up, say, I'm ready to start strong drink. Now, don't misunderstand my point or what Peter, more importantly, is saying here. He is not saying, well, their behavior would be fine if it was done at night. It's not what he's saying. Rather, he is trying to show us the extent of their depravity. 
He's trying to say that they don't even wait until nightfall to do this. Even the Romans, a people who were not known for their moral uprightness, even the Romans frowned upon daylight debauchery. That's his point. You are so bad that you're not even waiting until night. Where it's bad to do there, but you're making it even worse. Because of their immoral behavior, as members of the visible church, these false teachers, as Peter calls them, were blots and blemishes. They were blots and blemishes on the bride of Christ. A stain on the church of the living God. As these false teachers mar the church, Peter will go on to exhort us at the end of this letter, 2 Peter 3.14. He tells us that we ought to be found by him without spot, without blemish. In this, he is calling us to be like Christ, who, as you may recall, he referred to in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, he referred to Christ as the one having no blemish, no spot, no wrinkle upon him. The contrast here is between these false teachers who look nothing like Christ and the church of the living God that is growing into its likeness, who is growing into the image and being sanctified more and more to be like Christ. Their stain on the church is all the more horrendous because as Peter says at the end of verse 13, they're reveling in their deception of believers even while they enjoy fellowship with the church. As if to say again, look how deep their depravity is. They're not doing this on their own time as it were, but they're doing this in the church with you. These false teachers were using their participation in the community of believers as an excuse for their sin. They were using the times where the church got together to fellowship with one another and have meals, and they were using that as an excuse for their own sin. When these false teachers ate with other believers, they didn't use this as an opportunity to seek the good of others. They didn't eat with them and say, how may I be a blessing to you today? But instead they used it as an opportunity to pursue their own bodily pleasures, their own bodily desires. What makes their behavior all the more heinous is that these feasts where they were doing this typically included and concluded with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. They took communion together. So these false teachers were using the Lord's Supper as an opportunity to get drunk. And in so doing, they were defiling the very means of God's grace that he has given to his church. They were, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, eating and drinking condemnation upon themselves. And as if this was not enough to justify their pending judgment, their pending destruction, Peter provides further reasons in, verses, in verse 14 for why these false teachers will be destroyed. As if getting drunk at these feasts, as if defiling the Lord's Supper was not enough, Peter tells us that while they were there with the church, these false teachers looked at the women who were present and considered them potential partners, potential candidates for adultery. While they were getting drunk, they were also using it as an opportunity to see who might want to commit adultery with them. He says their appetite for sin was insatiable. They would try to entice immature or young believers to join them in their debauchery. The word Peter uses here that is translated as enticed in the English Standard Version 
It's a word that's used to describe how bait is placed in order to catch prey in hunting or fishing. It's like they were casting out a line with the lure on it and seeing who might bite. In addition to their drunkenness and sexual sins, Peter points out that they were also motivated by material possessions. He tells us that they were trained in greed. It is not, it is not just that they were greedy. No, it's far beyond that. It's not just that they had hearts that were covetousness, that they wanted other things, but it says that they did it in such a way that they, they practiced it. They, they did it in a way so they could get better at it. They spent time training so they could become better at being greedy. And because of this, Peter tells us, they are accused children standing under the curse of God for what they have done and especially for harming Christ's bride, his church. As we have been working our way through First and Second Peter, I have constantly been reminded of our current culture. I have seen reflections of what Peter is describing in our own current day. Much of how Peter describes these individuals is very reminiscent of our own day and age. And I know that some of you have seen that as well. As many of you know, last month, I went and I addressed the Flagstaff City Council as they were seeking to adopt a resolution in favor of abortion, in favor of murdering the unborn. While I was there, I saw in vivid display in front of me what Peter describes in First and Second Peter Particularly, I saw what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.4. 4. I saw it in a vivid picture. Here's what he says. And I saw this so clear in what was going on there. It says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. I cannot think of a better way to describe our current culture. We look around and we see, and I love how Peter phrases it. We look around and we see a flood of debauchery in our day. And when the church does not join in this debauchery, when the church does not celebrate this debauchery, we are maligned. We are called all sorts of names. And in some instances, we are shot at and killed for what we believe. What is ultimately surprising in our passage that's before us this morning is Peter's not speaking about behavior of those out in the world. He's talking about people inside the church those who claim to be part of the body of Christ. Can you see now why they are blots and blemishes on the bride that he is seeking to make pure, that he is seeking to wash with his word? Then he goes on to tell us in verse 15 that these false teachers have forsaken the right path and have gone astray. Much like Israel in the Old Testament, these false teachers have not obeyed what God has called them to. Instead of following the example Christ has left, Peter tells us that they have followed the way of Balaam. They follow Balaam on the road of disobedience to God for the sake of their own financial profit. Now, Peter uses Balaam, a character from the Old Testament we find in Numbers chapter 22 through Numbers chapter 25. He uses this character to compare these false teachers and to use them as an illustration for their love for wrongdoing, 
That's how much they love wrongdoing. They're like Balaam. Just as Balaam was rebuked by his donkey. How depraved do you have to be that it takes a donkey to rebuke you? Just as Balaam was rebuked by his donkey, so too these false teachers ought to be rebuked. As one commentator puts it, the donkeys speaking to Balaam indicated that Balaam had less insight into what God was doing than his animal. That the prophet of God had had less knowledge about what was going on with God than his donkey did. That's these false teachers. That's what he's telling us. So we've seen this morning the false teacher's destruction and we've seen the false teacher's deception. Let's conclude with this this morning. If you're anything like me, as you reflect on this passage this morning, your natural inclination is to rejoice in the fact that you are not as bad as these false teachers. Pastor, I've never gotten drunk at the Lord's Supper. Pastor, I don't go to church scouting for someone to commit adultery with. Our tendency is to get puffed up when we see that we do not do all the things that these false teachers do. But as we think of these false teachers, we are not to think of ourselves as better than them. Because if the word of God tells us very clearly, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As Jesus reminds us, if we have looked upon another with lust in our hearts, we have committed adultery with them. So instead of looking at this passage and being filled with pride, oh, thank you, God, that I am not like one of these false teacher sinners. Instead of doing that, our passage this morning should allow these false teachers to be an example. To be an example to us of who we would be apart from Christ. That we do these things. That we are no better than them. That our hearts Although we we mask it, we find ways to, to make it look nice, we put a nice bow tie on to hide it. But our hearts are as dark as theirs are, apart from the grace of God. And instead of thinking to ourselves, God, thank you that I'm not like them, we ought to be saying to ourselves, God, thank you for sending Christ, who did not act like any of this, Ever, not for a moment. He, for, he fulfilled your law perfectly. He did what I was called to do. He lived the life that you have called me to live, and He did it perfectly. Lord, thank you for Jesus. So often in the church, we are able to say, Well, I'm not that bad, and by God's grace, we're not that bad. Some of us are being sanctified by God's grace and being made more and more like Jesus. But if not for the grace of God, go I. Apart from Christ, apart from God's grace that intervened into our lives and to our hearts, we would be these people. And I just spend a moment looking at my own heart. And I see the depths of darkness and depravity that are there. And I could easily see that this would be me apart from God's grace pulling me back. So when we see this example, we ought to be warned and we ought to be ones who thank God that Christ is the one who fulfilled God's law for us. That we stand before God not on our own righteousness. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we stand before God and he asks us, why are you here? Our answer must be, our answer can only be because of Jesus. 
if we begin to answer God, why should I let you in? By saying, well, because I did this, I did that. I gave to the church. I had perfect attendance at Sunday school for four years. If that's our answer, we are lost. We are on a boat leading to nowhere. The only answer that we can give is Jesus. And by God's grace, illumining our hearts, we cry out to him and we say, Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for not doing this stuff. Our hearts are prone to this. You have not done this. And because of him, God can look at us and say, you are perfect. You're perfect, believer. You, the one trusting in Christ, right there. You're perfect. Not because you've done it, but because Christ did it. That's what this passage should remind us of this morning. As these false teachers come and seek to give a blot and a blemish to the bride of Christ, we ought to remember that the bride of Christ, because of Christ, will be without spot or wrinkle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful news, this wonderful gospel message that our Savior has come he has lived a perfect life. He has died for us. He is raised for our justification so that we can stand before you without spot or wrinkle. And Lord, we thank you that day by day, more and more you are making us like Christ. That is your work that you are doing by grace alone. Lord, nothing in our hands we bring simply to the cross of Christ do we cling. That is our only hope. It's our only peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, cover us, wash us, renew us, make us more like Christ. For your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.